We come before you, Jesus, uh, aware uh, of the the world not being right, uh, aware of some of our longings for things to be different. Um, some of us are like excited to be here, and uh, things are going well, and some of us are not as excited and having a lot of struggles. And uh, so we come together as a community and and cry out together to you. And uh, I pray uh, that you would help us to hear the things that you want us to hear, uh, help us to not dwell on things that are said that are uh, just not the thing that you're trying to communicate to us. I ask that you uh, would uh, be at work through me and through the people here. And we declare this space your kingdom and invite you uh, to rule on earth as you do in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. So welcome to the end of 2018, our last service. Uh, Generally, what we've done for uh, our sort of launching into the new year is uh, talk about this idea of doing 20 prayers for the year. Uh, It's something that a number of us have done together. uh, And basically what we do is we uh, do five prayers for ourselves five prayers for family or the people that you're extra close to, five prayers for the village or whatever faith community you're most tightly connected to, and five prayers for the world or Tucson or in whatever way you're involved in the the larger community of people. Um, the, The idea of this... Um, is something, I think Eric started it a long time ago, but it's been a way for our community to tell our stories together. So for example, I'll start with my crazy 20 prayers for the year. Uh, in 2016, I was having a great deal of arthritis pain. I've had arthritis since I was in my early 20s. And the when I have pain that goes past my pain threshold, I don't want to pray. And I don't want to ask God for things because it just feels pointless. So rather than doing this in January, I actually wrote my 20 prayers in March. <laughs> um, and as... Part of my practice when I do this, I often ask God what I should be praying for, because I don't know, like, you know, five things out of however many. And so I asked God, and I felt like God said I should ask for less pain. And I, I wish I could say that I asked that, and it was just this deep moment of faith but I really had this guttural reaction to God that was, that is stupid. Why would I waste one of my five prayers on having less pain? You've never given me that. You always give me more pain. I've had the arthritis since I was 21. That's ridiculous. But I believed that God was telling me to ask for that. So I wrote it down as one of my prayers. I also wrote something about getting more exercise. And, uh, and so I got a bike. I went out on my first voyage on my fold-up bike. And the, I didn't get the handlebars snapped in properly because it's a folding bike. And I'm riding, and it's great. I'm remembering how much I like to ride a bike. And then I hit something and the handlebars went like collapsed basically (laughs) 
and I flew off the bike, and I slammed my head into the curb. Uh, I had a helmet on, so I like I think I was okay. Maybe had a slight concussion. Ninety percent drop in pain. All like crazy. Like I was to the point where I was thinking about going on disability. Uh, I was having stabbing pains in the back of my head. Like it was. It was a crazy, crazy answer to prayer. But not the one that I would have expected. Prayer doesn't get answered often the way we expect it to to happen. And that makes prayer kind of a touchy subject sometime. Um, So what are some of your ideas? Like, like why, why do you pray? Or why do you... What, what's the purpose of prayer for, for people? Why, why do you think prayer is something you might do? Yeah? Okay. So you pray to practice. A tough discipline. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. You you see things that you would like God to do in the lives of your neighbors and household, and so you throw it up to prayer as a request. Yes. <laughs> good. Good thought. I I pray because I remember it's an option. Yeah. That's really cool. I should have given you given the microphone out for this. I, w- I was not expecting the long answers, but the, just to summarize for the recording, she has a prayer journal that she keeps with prayers and visual stuff uh, to share with her kids as a part of telling the story of of what God's done. That's that's really cool. In order to understand why we pray and what prayer actually is, we kind of have to have a little bit of a context of who God is and what what our connection to him is. So I'm going to actually, Tim, if you'll cue up, we're just going to watch a short Lord of the Rings clip. Sons of Gondor, of Rohan, my brothers! I see in your eyes the same fear that would take the heart of me. A day may come when the courage of men fails, when we forsake our friends and break all bonds of fellowship. But it is not this day. An hour of wolves and shattered shields when the age of men comes crashing down. But it is not this day. This day we fight. By all that you hold dear on this good earth, I bid you stand, men of the West!
thought I'd die fighting side by side with an elf. What about side by side with a friend? I... I could do that. God. <laughs> so this is this is a scene in the Lord of the Rings uh, towards the end, and they're not going into uh, we're going to have an immediate victory battle. They're going into a battle that is basically they're saying I'm going to show up and I'm going to try to do something that will help my friend who's doing another part of the battle that's his own journey and we're going to basically cre- have this battle not because we think we can defeat this huge number of people but because we are a part of a story we're part of a larger uh, group of, of people who are working together for good so when we come to prayer Particularly as Americans, sometimes we think of it as sort of a very personal, like, I pray because I want to talk to God and I want things or those kind of things, or I'm, I'm praying for these people. But prayer is really a big part of the battle that we're in. And so what I want to start with is sort of having this sense of the grand narrative of the kingdom that we're coming into uh, in Colossians two thirteen to 15, it says, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross, and having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. So what what they're talking about here is, and I like that we sang, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, because it, all of Israel was expecting, like they've been living this narrative where they interact with God and they're priests to the world and God is doing all these things in their story because God has this very long, large narrative that isn't about good or evil or like whether suffering happens or not. It's a narrative of bringing the world together, bringing people into communion with this perfect communion that happens between the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So, so it's not about like how things get done or, you know, whether I obey or don't obey or any of those kinds of things. The narrative that we're invited into is this very large opportunity to engage with the God of the universe in a way that's that's real and tangible. And the battle, it, it says in Ephesians 6.12, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. So we're, we're here doing our physical stuff. And, but when I love someone, there's a spiritual impact that happens in the large battle that is going on uh, that God is going to win. And that Jesus triumphed over 
not through power, not through uh, the ways of Rome. Like to say this to the Romans that he dis- he made a public spectacle of of Rome and the world and and the the people who are in power triumphing over them by the cross. What what happens is it is a complete flipping of what good of what what brings meaning what brings life and glory and good things in rome the battles brought the glory the glory that these guys are fighting for is a glory that's about being together and supporting one another and caring for one another and that's like that's this kind of thing that we're being brought into this communion with God, uh, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Um, So in the passage that we read, um, it says, it talks about us crying out, Abba, Father. It says we've been chosen as like the children of God. And so when we identify ourselves, when we choose to live under the rule of Jesus, that we were were his children, we're heirs with Christ. Um, There's a lot of, in the Christian world, argument about, you know, Abba Father and does it mean Daddy and all that kind of stuff. Mostly what it means is not slave. This is is a situation where an all-powerful king says, I want you to address me like I would only let a, a son or a daughter or a child address me. In, in, the, in the, this time in history, a servant would not say Abba. That, that's not something they would say. Um, and so we're, we're invited into, as a part of this grand battle, we're invited into a relationship that is about family and connectedness and love and a common mission. And so when we, when we cry out, Abba, Father, which is sort of one of the things that we do in the, in the 20 prayers idea, uh, is that we're, like, especially the ones where it's, like, the ones for ourselves, there's this sense that we're, like, we're just going to say, hey, you're you're my dad, uh, and I'm gonna I'm gonna offer what I want. Now I know that is problem. It's problematic for me because I my dad died when I was two, and I had a jerk of a stepdad. So you know I I, I don't have good images of what a dad is. Um, when I and that's another thing that God has brought to me in the context of community is an understanding of what a father is, what the difference, you know, is between a good father and and not. So when we when we call out we're we're it's again, it's a it's a proclamation to the spiritual world that says I believe you are God. I believe you care about me. I believe you created me for something more than what we experience here on on earth. When when Jesus uses this, he he because um, the Abba is only used three times in the Bible, and one of them is Jesus when he's about to get crucified. Mark fourteen. 32 says, they went to a place called Gethsemane and Jesus said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. He took Peter, James, and John along with him and he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, he said to them. Stay here and keep watch. Going a little farther, he fell to the ground and prayed that if possible, the hour might pass from him. Abba, Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. This is a really raw moment that doesn't happen between 
a slave and a master. This is a really raw moment that happens between a child that's trusting the goodness of the person that they're asking. And when we allow ourselves to do that, even, you know, I can't say I was like fully believing that God was actually going to do anything. And to be honest with you, I still have pain. Like I still have arthritis and it's, it, it's not gone away. But, but in, in saying Abba Father, we're making a spiritual proclamation of, of who God is, of who we are before God, and of what, what Christ has done in order to, uh, to free us. The second part, I think, of, of this is that we are, like, praying as a part of joining Jesus in the restoration of the kingdom. The world is wrong. It is messed up. Things are not the way they're supposed to be. And we, we battle against that. We're, you know, why suffering? Why does there have to be suffering? Because we're battling against the immediate feelings that we have about about life. Um, in in uh, in the passage, uh, it says, "I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed." For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and and glory of the children of God. The whole creation is groaning. And if you look around, you can see it. If you look inside yourself, you can see those places where you want things to be different, but you can't seem to change them. Or those places where you're longing for a restoration of relationship and it just doesn't seem to happen and you can't seem to make it happen. The places where you see your kids are struggling and you can't help them (coughs) not. You know, you can't rescue them. But the thing that God is bringing is this glory of creation. So originally, like the creation was something really made to reflect the image of God, and sin came in and and sort of wrecked that. And so what we have is the these really crazy, beautiful, glorious things in creation that are mucked up and that have weight of the wrong way of thinking, weight of uh, woundedness, weight of fear, weight of anxiety laid on us and on creation so that it, so that we don't reflect the glory of God. And it's not the way the the glory of God being revealed in us is about us being who we were created to be. It's not just about like, oh, I need to make myself different so that I can reflect God's glory. It's that is that we were created to reflect God's glory. And so when we when we declare, like when we come into this space you know, in, in the clip, they're, they're this circle of people, right? That They were the kingdom. They were, they were the kingdom right there. And they were surrounded by the different way of believing, by, the, by power, by evil, by, by uh, darkness. They were holding together and, 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 and living the kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. They're asking for something to be done. In, um, 
and again, it, the the way that these things that this all happened is not when the, when the Jews were waiting to be rescued out of Israel or rescued out of Rome by the Messiah. They were not expecting someone who would come and be crucified in a very humiliating way. And so when you when you join yourself into that narrative, what you're saying is I'm flipping my my worldly understanding of what is true and what the world has communicated to me and what a lot of my own intuition says and I'm I'm filtering it through this new way of thinking. And in the present, that means suffering. And suffering is a hard, hard thing. It, it you know, it's not. We don't enjoy it. We don't want to see our, the people we love go through it. Uh, we ask a lot of whys when when things are happening that are not how they should be. When we ask for God for something and and we don't get the thing that we think, why why wouldn't you give this to me? And so we we focus on how to stop suffering or uh, how to explain suffering or how to, you know, kind of make things better through power. And what Jesus is inviting us into is a flipping of that. In um, Hebrews 12, Jesus says, or it sa- uh, Paul says that Jesus endured the cross for the joy set before him. So when he was on the cross, when he's, ta- when he's asking his father to take away the cup, it's not, it's not that he's not really feeling like he wants the cup to be taken away. It's that even in that moment, he is connected to the bigger story that is about joy and communion, not about whether or not you have to suffer in this in this world. Uh, in our in the passage, it says uh, that our present suffering is not worth comparing to the glory that's going to be revealed. And we taste this. We taste this in our relationships with one another when we when we bring the gospel to bear on those relationships and when we offer. Uh, unselfish love, when we minister to people not out of a place of power, but out of a place of vulnerability and sacrifice. The third thing that that struck me about all this is, uh, is that a part of what we're doing is we're longing with the spirit in a fallen world. So a big part of the prayers that we offer are it's this groaning for things to be right. And sometimes we, we, we name what we think will make it right or what we think will make it more, more bearable. But Jesus gives us the understanding of what that is, that it's this joy set before us. It's this thing that we begin to taste when we declare spaces, the kingdom of God, and begin to live by this other set of rules and ethics and but when we do that and when we are connected to the things that we're feeling sometimes the groaning gets worse sometimes when you taste something of what could be really good when I see Keith my husband care about Anna in a way that's really beautiful it's really beautiful but it's also really painful because I, I didn't have that. And so while we're here, there's this like awareness as we begin to awaken to what God is doing and what the bigger story is and what glory looks like. You know, when you see someone who's been burdened down with something and then all of a sudden, like through whatever process of healing and transformation, they're able to let something go and you see that bit of, of, muck come off of this beautiful creation it's it's amazing 
you know, and I've doing soul care with people in this community. I've just been really blessed to be able to be a part of different stories and to see those moments when someone lets go of the thing that, that was just so mucking up their glory that, you know, you wondered if it was even there, you know? Um, so, so with the 20 years or 20 prayers, (laughs) 20 years, uh, it's, I want to invite you to kind of, to kind of practice these things in the, in the 20 prayers, um, to practice just asking God for stuff without fear. I think I skipped my slides. To, to to believe, not that you're going to get everything that you ask for, but to hope, right? To hope that you will. And the reason we do it together as a community is because that's what a kingdom is. Like, if, if one of those guys had gone out on the battlefield, he, they wouldn't have, he wouldn't have even accomplished anything. You know, it would have been whack and... And gone, you know. Um, but as a community, we come. And and the beauty of being a part of this grand narrative is that it's not just me. It's not just us. And that's part of, as we look at the 20 prayers, like we're longing for all of creation to like for the glory to be revealed. And when we pray together as a community, we're going to begin to see that and we're going to be encouraged. I love uh, Jillian's journal because that is the thing that, that actually writing down some prayers, you begin to see, oh, this is where God did something. And you can share that with people. And we encourage one another to share things that God is doing or things that he's, that he's not doing the way you want, it, want him to. And as a community that is something that we want to do together because that's, that's how God engages us, not just as individuals, but as a community of people who are a part of a, a, a larger story that is coming into fulfillment and happening now and will happen in, a, in more completeness in the, in the future and has happened in the past. The Bible is like a ton of stories about people wrestling with God over different things. And we get to continue on the stories. And the 20 prayers gives us an opportunity to say, what do we want God to do as a community? Like, what do we want to see in each other? What do I, what do I, you know, what, what do I want to be different in me? What are the areas where I'm either stuck in my own selfishness or areas where I feel utterly helpless to change and to begin to just offer those out and and then look back throughout the year and begin to realize the the way the crazy ways that God works. If I hadn't written that prayer down and then you just looked at my head getting slammed on the cement it wouldn't have the same meaning. It wouldn't, it wouldn't really tell the story that's happening here at the village that lots of you have been a part of, of my wrestling with my own physical illness. It, it wouldn't be a part of that narrative. It would be a thing that happened. But a part of writing things down and, and doing it together where we can remind each other and look back and, and consider how God is transforming us, it allows us to come together as a community and and begin to see and to tell the stories of of what God's doing. the The gospel, uh, the idea of the gospel, is something that Caesar would do, 
And basically the gospel of Caesar would be a group of people after a battle telling all the, you know, and we killed these people and we conquered this land and it was all about power. The go- like the gospel of Caesar was all about what have I done? Uh, how have I made myself more? And when Jesus co-ops the term, the Christians co-opt the term, the gospel, it, it's a, it's this story of conquering that is is not the way it is in the world. It's conquering with love and compassion and sacrifice. And we get to do that together. And the other conquering does not bring joy. The other conquering does not bring connectedness, communion, and a lot of the things that we that we get to experience. He may not have to suffer in the same, you know, Caesar maybe got his way more and maybe didn't have to suffer in particular physical ways that other people did. But it wasn't something that was going to bring joy. It was something that brought power and that was about a power dynamic. And what we're invited into is this experience of joy that we experience now as we begin to pray for the kingdom to come here on earth and also as we pray for the fullness of what that's going to be in time. What's the time rule, Sue? Do you know what the time rule is? 6.15? couple, yeah. So um, what, I, what I would like to open it up for you, I mean, if you have comments, that's fine too, but is if, if there are things that are like barriers to you praying, like what are some of those things and how can we like support one another in that? But also if you have questions, that's fine too. Anybody? I think um, probably one of the problems that I have with praying on a regular basis is that I don't always feel comfortable asking for things. Or if I have asked people for things, I don't get it. So I'm like, why should I ask God for this if he's not going to give it to me because nobody else has given it to me? Yeah. So I need to figure out how to get over that. So that's going to have to be one of my 20 prayers for the next year. <laughs> Very nice. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 there's a lot of traps to asking God for things, especially if what you're thinking is I'm going to ask for things so that I can get that thing, that specific thing that I asked for. And when God is listening to our prayers, he's not, it's not that he doesn't care what we're asking for, but he isn't trying to, like, he, it's, it's a big across time and space plan that he's weaving together for the good of those who love him. It's not just the immediate. And he doesn't mind if we pray for, like, like, like he doesn't mind if we ask for a car or, you know, or for the healing of our friend. You know, I, he's not up there judging whether we're asking for the right thing or, but it is a vulnerable place. It's a vulnerable place when you ask God for things. So I had a conversation with my sister one day, and she had the same concern. She felt like when she was praying, she didn't really like asking him for too much. She felt like she's selfish and it's always about me, me, me. And I remember I went to church, and we had a Bible study about prayers, too. And... um if you have a hard time praying and asking, it's always another way of doing it's praying for others as community. Because I feel the same way, too, when I pray. I feel like it's always about me, me, me. But then if you need prayers, that's when we work as community, you need to ask somebody to pray for you. Mm-hmm. Um, I remember one time I was having car problems. I actually texted Julie. <laughs> and I said, can you please pray for me about my car? 
And then I text multiple. So we have to have like, like a circle of prayers and God will just work through you, through them, and it, you'll, it'll be given to you. So you don't really have to keep asking. You can ask your family and friends to pray for you. And then on your part, you pray for your family and friends. Yeah. I look at prayer as my, it's my responsibility to pray and ask for things or just to pray. It's God's responsibility to give them to me. And it's not, uh, there's not a, there's a little bit of desire that I want these things because I'm talking to them. But the idea is that I'm talking to them and telling them what, what my wants are. And he already knows what those are. But I'm just, it's a part of the relationship is informing him. Yeah. The relationship piece is one of the really key elements because when you're asking your dad, a good dad, for things, it's not necessarily about, I know that I'm going to get everything I ask for. It's about, I know that you want good things for me. And what am I, what am I going to ask for that? Did you still? Have? We can probably do like one or two more. Um, I almost feel bad asking because I don't because it sounds like a block. But anyway, something that's always been a block for me is this idea that God loves other people more than I love them, and just the crazy responsibility. Like, is He really going to do something that He wouldn't have done for that person if I hadn't prayed, or? I don't know, that just, that that kind of, like, I don't understand, like, my power in that or whatever. Right. I I think when we, when we pray, it's about that participating in the restoration of the kingdom. It's about participating in this relationship with a God who is doing things. And we talk to him because he's our dad and because he is doing cool things and we're a part of the same mission. And I, uh, one of the passages, in the passage, it talks about we don't always know what to pray for, but the Spirit groans with us and, and talks to God about what we long for. And I, I think that's, we just don't have to worry about what we pray for. It's just a matter of talking to God. Was there one more? Um. For when I'm praying alone, sometimes if I'm struggling and having a hard time, a barrier for me can just be like trying to find God in all my emotions. So that is what comes to my mind. But that's where I often find myself asking other people to pray for me because I feel like somebody who's holding tighter to the gospel, when they can pray that for me, I feel like it um, puts my emotions into their right little spot. <laughs> and... Um, but that's where I feel really grateful for that piece of prayer of in- others praying over us and with us and bearing our burdens together and yeah. the gospel. So. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Well, I would encourage you to talk to one another, to ask God what you should pray for, to to ask other people, like, I, what are some of the things that I've been talking about that maybe I should be praying about instead? Um, and to to kind of open yourself uh, to what God might be doing, because he's doing really cool things in our community. And this year, it's, you know, it's an opportunity to engage with those things that God is at work doing. Um, okay. Now the next part. (laughs) Let me close in prayer. Jesus, thank you for uh, just the way, the way that you have worked this crazy narrative throughout time and history and, um, and through our weakness and uh, the idea that all of that could come together uh, for good and for communion is is just hard to grasp. And so I I pray that as we 
offer up prayers that we would begin to just believe that you're really doing something and um, and that we would support one another uh, as a community in that. In Jesus' name, amen.